Hey everyone, this is Pastor Daniel here, otherwise known as Rev D, and I just want to say thank you for taking the time to watch today's message. I believe the Lord gave me a word that you are in need of today, so get that pencil out because I believe you're going to be taking some serious notes. Also, like, share, subscribe, and stay engaged with us by those comments, by letting us know where you're watching from. And we are excited to look back on this message and see how it was blessing you even online today. I look forward to seeing what God's going to do through this message in your life. Thank you. I want to greet all those watching online today. And uh, we have a new member of the Mountain View family. Miss Adrian had her baby yesterday, her and Rico. Yay! Proud parents of their second little baby boy, uh, Liam. Liam Acosta. So, if you, hey, if you're watching online uh, let them know how, first of all, glad you are to have them back home, and, and uh, that would be in this home. I'm sure they're not at their home just yet, and how excited you are for them, as well as let us know where you're watching from. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Hey, listen. Now, listen. I, I feel like last week we had a breakdown in our communication. Somewhere, I failed to fully explain to you the need for the chairs for the new building. Because I remember saying we had 679 chairs left, and I believed that last Sunday was going to be the day that we accomplished that, and we were going to have no more chairs needed for this new building project. But only 16 of y'all bought a chair. So somewhere, y'all did not pick up the words that I was putting down, and you did not understand the words that were coming out of my mouth. So that's my fault. I'll take the blame for that. So in saying that, we have 663 chairs left to secure 100% uh, capacity for our new building. And the reason why it's important right now, because we're six months out, you got to put a deposit on these chairs. And I don't have the money right now, as y'all know. So if you could help a brother out and donate $200, 100% of the profit, or excuse me, 100% of that $200 will go to the chairs. And you are securing the seat for somebody. Because every chair, every seat represents a soul. That was spend eternity somewhere. So if you haven't done that, and you don't have to give it all today, maybe it take you a couple months to do that. That's completely fine. But we do need to secure these chairs because we are, we are, Lord willing, about six months from this building opening up. Um, how often do you look at the stories in the scripture and think that they don't relate to your life? I think particularly the Old Testament, right? We, we read these stories of antiquity and we're asking how do they relate to me practically? So um, maybe they're irrelevant and they really don't have a place in my life because some of the Old Testament stories are pretty crazy, right? But the Bible's message is a timeless message. And the reason why I like doing character studies or, or preaching about individuals is because those uh, common events and emotions and experiences that they're walking through in some way, shape, or form, we're going to be walking through as well. The Bible does speak to the human condition. In fact, you can go all the way back to our first parents, Adam and Eve, and see that the things that they went through are really the still the things that we go through. Uh, we as people long for acceptance and approval. Uh, we as people, we still admire beauty and intelligence and we still get outraged when we have injustice or something that we perceive as treachery. The story that we're going to read today may be 4,000 years old, but it still speaks to one of the most basic human needs, and that is that we long for love. We can be surrounded by people and not feel supported by them. Have you ever been there? Where you're in a room full of people and you still feel all alone. So these stories of the Bible, they still mean something. There's just some things about the human condition that never changes. Um, psychologists say that for most of us, the default voice that we hear in our mind, the, the place that we go to, that feeling, um, is one of discouragement. And what that means is when something happens to us that our brain will automatically fill in the gap with negativity whether it is true or not. And it's not so much what happens to us that matters, it's how we perceive what happens to us that matters. It's the story that we tell ourselves that ultimately becomes the soundtrack of our lives. So I just want to ask you 
a question. Have you been discouraged lately? You can raise your hand. I, I won't ask you what for. But have you experienced maybe uh, despair or despondency? I'm, I'm not going to the extent of calling it depression just yet, but you, you've been discouraged. I, I can say that, that, that that's true for me. Um, I, I woke up Monday morning feeling good. Now, I don't normally wake up on Monday morning feeling good. I usually wake up in a funk. There's like this, this brain fog and my, my body is somewhat aching all day, recovering from the crash of of, of the, the weekend, but I woke up this, this Monday feeling good. Maybe the Lord was kind of setting me up. I don't really know for what I was about to experience next. And I, I went into the, the, the kitchen and I kind of have this routine. I am a creature of habit. I've got these disciplines that I go through and some chores, if you want to call them that. So I was, I was doing them and hadn't got to my Bible study just yet. And I make sure I drink water when I first get up and I'll drink my coffee. And, and I was looking over the, the swimming pool in, in my backyard and I noticed that there was a waterfall flowing into my backyard that I don't normally have. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that the chickens next door were floating above the fence because when I looked at my backyard, my backyard was flooded. Now, if you've been with us on this journey for a long time, you know that the Lord has given me a messenger of Satan to buffet me. And I've already prayed for this thing to be removed three times, but there's a devil in my drip system, y'all. And no matter how much I pray for this thing to be removed, the Lord keeps me on my knees because I got to stay on my knees fixing that thing all the time. I wish that I could tell you that that was the worst thing that happened to me on Monday, but it seemed to set off a chain of events that not only lasted, lasted late into the night on Monday, but the problem is it lasted all week and I'm probably still dealing with it when I woke up this morning. And I think that you guys have been in those moments as well, that when your days go to the dog, all of a sudden your, your week starts to smell like you've been hanging around dogs. I think that you can put yourself in my situation for just a moment and you can imagine that this building project is, is a very stressful thing. You know, really working day to day, week to week, month to month, not knowing where money's gonna come from. Like, first of all, and praise the Lord because God has been faithful. Little by little, he keeps coming through, amen. <laughs> praise the Lord and that for your generosity, but it's a little stressful. It's a hard season for me. Daughter going to college tomorrow, you know, son being God all, all summer long. But here's the thing. This isn't a new season. Life, as you know, is filled with ups and downs. The truth is, that's why some of you are here today. You came to church because you need an encouragement. And church is a place that encourages you. That is why our vision is very simple. It's to help you win. I am not here to just educate you today. I am here to encourage you. I'm not just here to inform you. I am here to inspire you. Because the world can be a very mean and nasty place. It rains upon the just and the unjust. The Bible says in this world you will have trouble. Every king and every slave will experience a cave of discouragement. It does not discriminate. And it's taken me 40 years to figure that out because I used to think that the, the stronger that I grew in my faith, the less discouraged that I would get. But unfortunately, after working in a church for the past 25 years and being in a Christian almost my entire life, I've learned the opposite, that the more that I deal with people and the closer that I get to fulfilling the, the, the purpose that God put me on this earth to do, and the more passion that I have, the more intense the battle with discouragement and disappointment becomes. Because life is messy. So what do we do when these minutes turn into moments and the moments turn into days and the days turn into weeks and hopefully they don't turn into months and years? Um, if I were to ask you today to think of one person in the past 100 years that made a difference in the world for good, somebody that loved God and, and loved people and, and served their fellow a man, I don't think it would take very long if we passed the microphone around for somebody to say Mother Teresa. But Mother Teresa wrote this in her personal journal. She said, they say people in hell suffer pain because of the loss of God. Yet in my soul, I feel the same terrible pain of God not wanting me. Darkness surrounds me on all sides. I have no light in my soul. I speak of the tender love of God, yet I long to believe it myself. This untold darkness and loneliness and longing for God gives me a pain deep in my heart and I feel that he does not want me. This is Mother Stinking Teresa <laughs> who has served God and her fellow man with all of her heart. For goodness sake, she took a vow of poverty. Yes, she deals with discouragement in much the same way that you and I do. 
You may remember back in the summer, we went to the Ten Commandments, and we talked about bearing false witness, and we talked about Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, the pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, just a great man of God. And you may remember some of the false lies that the London publication spread about him, about him being a womanizer, and it really went across the entire world. And the problem was it wasn't true. But he dealt with this stigma his entire life. And here's what he wrote. I would not wish upon my worst enemy the depths of despair and discouragement I often feel for weeks and months at a time. You see, growing closer to God does not mean that we graduate from discouragement. Some of the, the greatest men in, in the Bible who have ever lived, like Elijah or David or Job or even Moses, wrote about their times of despair. Even John the Baptist, whom Jesus said there's been no other man as great as this man born into a woman like John the Baptist, he became discouraged. Yet by looking at these men and women in the scripture that we see, God still used them to provide hope even when they were walking through a personal hell. So that's why I love the Bible. The Bible's not all, you know, sugar cookies and, and, and puppy dogs and rainbows. The Bible's really real. And it, it walks us through the entire story, so that, that gives me hope. So what we want to ask today is, well, what do we do in the meantime? Is, is there anything that, that we can do to help us in our battle with discouragement? Is it possible to hold on to the promises of God when it appears that God is holding out on us? I, I want to look at a story in, in the Bible today of a mostly overlooked lady. In fact, I'm going to ask you a question how much do you really know about Leah? And, and the reason why I'm asking you that question today is because we have been dropping seeds along the way about the story of Leah, but I'm really just asking you, what do you really know about her? And then let me catch you up to speed here. Um, Abraham had Isaac at the age of 100. Isaac had two sons. We looked at them the past two weeks, Jacob and Esau. That's what we were talking about. We saw last week that, that Jacob tricked his brother into giving him his inheritance over you know, a bowl of, of stew. Uh, once Esau figures this out, that he's lost his physical blessing and his spiritual birthright, he makes the decision that he's going to kill Jacob. When Rebecca hears this, because remember, Rebecca favors Jacob. He's a mama's boy. Um, she goes in and she deceives Isaac into letting Jacob leave his home based on the lie of not wanting him to marry a Canaanite woman. Uh, she sent Jacob to her brother Laban, hoping that he would marry one of his daughters. Now, apparently, y'all weren't following that closely because she sends her son to go marry one of his cousins. I know we got some people from Arkansas and West Virginia in here, y'all, but I, I just, that's not natural for Oklahoma. We want our trees to fork a little bit more. We want some branches hanging on that thing. All right, I'm just telling you, the Bible is kind of crazy at times, right? And I need to tell you that this is not a parenting sermon. Um, but do you mind if I give you some parenting advice? Yes. You need to be who you want your kids to become. I don't care who you are. You will leave a legacy. And it will be based upon the patterns that you leave behind. And you can have a good heart, but if you've got bad habits, your heart will not overcome your habits. And one of our plumb line statements here at Mountain View is what does not get healed gets handed down. You will pass down to your kids your hurts and your hab habits and your hangups. So, parents, if your kid is bitter, look in the mirror. If your kid is angry, look in the mirror. If your kid is a smart mouth, look in the mirror. Yeah. Quit yelling at your kids. They're just a reflection of you. Sin is cyclical. And if you don't defeat your demons now, you will pass them to your kids they will become generational patterns. And Jacob learned deceit from his, his mother, but in fact, it goes deeper than that because if you look at his father Isaac and his, great -grand, or his grandfather Abraham, they were deceivers too because both of these men lied about their wives being their sister. So let me say this to you again. What does not get healed gets handed down. And that brings us to the story today in Genesis 29. When Jacob saw Rachel, daughter of his uncle, Laban, his cousin, and Laban's sheep, he went over and rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well and watered his uncle's sheep. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and began to weep aloud. He had told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and a son of Rebekah. 
So she ran and told her father. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he hurried to meet him. He embraced him and kissed him and brought him to the house. And there Jacob told him all these things. What are all these things, the, the things that we just got through talking about? Then Laban said to him, you are my own flesh and blood. So after Jacob had stayed with him for a whole month, Laban said to him, just because you're a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Miss Amy had a lovely figure and was beautiful. I just, I just see it. I just see it. Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. Hey, girl. Y'all get the good stuff. Y'all get the good stuff. Um, Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Ooh. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Ladies, ah, oh, that's so sweet. That's so sweet. Oh, that's so good. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed, and I want to make love to her. Now, young men in the room today, can I give you some advice? This is not a great way for you to ask your, your future father-in-law for his daughter's hand in marriage. That is not the way I went to Butch and said, can I marry Miss Amy? I did not start with that. Probably not best. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. And when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob. And Jacob made love to her. I got so many questions. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> How in the world does that happen, y'all? And Laban gave his daughter, or excuse me, his servant Zilpah to his daughter as her attendant. And when morning came... There was Leah, exclamation point, surprise. So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you've done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? This is why y'all got to love the Bible, man. This is better than the, as the world turns. This is better than all my children, days of our lives. Man, this is that TMZ National Enquirer type stuff. Mama told you it wasn't real. Oh, we're real, all right. Jacob deceived Esau, Rebekah deceived Isaac, Laban deceives Jacob, the player got played at his own game. How do you think Leah feels? See, in this culture, a woman's identity was in being married and having children. And for a younger sister, as we're about to, to read, to be married before an older sister was extremely humiliating. Let me ask you how you feel. How do you feel when you've been overlooked? How do you feel when you've been underappreciated? How do you feel when you've been lied about? How do you feel when you've been forgotten? So Laban replied, it is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Don't you think you could have told me that a while back? I know that. Finish this daughter's bridal week, then we will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her attendant. And Jacob made love to Rachel also, and his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah. And he worked for Laban another seven years. I want to draw your attention back to verse 17 where it says that Leah had weak eyes followed, but Rachel had a lovely figure. You see, this story does what we all do. We compare. We compare people. We compare pastors. We compare churches. We compare homes. We compare to how tall the truck is, how big the boat is. We compare the size of our, our houses and how many rooms and bathrooms and size of our lot. We compare bank accounts. And this had likely happened most of Leah's life. Leah has weak eyes, but Rachel is beautiful. And we can't help but compete when we are always being compared. She is smart, but she is pretty. He is good, 
but he is better. He's a great singer, but they are so much better. How many of you have ever been on the other side of a but they? But they are more qualified. But they are taller. But they are funnier. But they don't use notes. But they are anointed. But they are favored. And it stinks when we start saying but they. But Rachel. But Rachel. But Rachel. Have you ever been there? And even their names speak to their differences. Rachel means a ewe. That is a beautiful lamb. Leah's name means tired and weak. And there's a secondary name that means a cow. Now, I want to stop right here and say these types of names were actually common for herdsmen. It was actually not a, as bad as we, we make it sound. But come on, a tired and weary cow? We can only imagine what that means. Rachel had a beautiful figure, lovely skin, shiny eyes. We don't, we don't really know. We're making assumptions. But in comparison, Leah didn't. Did she have a weight problem? Was she, she oddly shaped? What, what does even weak eyes mean? Was it prone to infections? Was it nearsighted, farsighted? Was she blind? We, we don't know. And her family's tendency to favor Rachel, it could not have helped her sense of self-worth or self-esteem. Because every time you live on the other side of the butt, you know you never get over this. And some of you can relate that today because you've always been compared to a sibling. You've always been compared to a cousin or a coworker or a teammate or a classmate or a neighbor. And if you've ever been there, you know how discouraging that can be. So I have an older brother, you guys know that, and I absolutely love my older brother. He was a great older brother. I'm so proud of him even to this day. But he and I are complete opposites. Uh, he's very quiet. Uh, he's, he's shy. Um, he, he doesn't say much. He's worked in HR for the past 25 years. So that means that I probably would have had to go see him because I'm getting in trouble with HR because the things I say in my messages, they're the bane of my existence is what I'm trying to say. But he's a great older brother. And um, we grew up in a small town. And, and as you can imagine, in small towns, you end up having the same teachers that your siblings had because there's not like there's a bunch of classes and in fact I went to the same school that my grandpa went to that my dad went to and that my brothers went to so you could see there's a lot of comparison there and I ended up having the same teachers uh, that my older brother had so it never felt I would get this almost every single year you're Josh's brother right yeah but he was so quiet and you talks too much but he would sit still, and you can't sit still. But you know what? Joke's on them. I get paid to talk now. <laughs> but I heard that my, my entire life. And we must pay careful attention to three simple words that are actually given to us in verse 31, but they're easy to overlook, but they're filled with so much truth and meaning, and they pack a powerful punch. Let's read it. When the Lord saw, someone say, when the Lord saw. When the Lord saw. So when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel, this is a different but Rachel this time, remained childless. You see, the Bible very clearly says the Lord saw Leah. He saw all of her hurt. He saw all of the deceit. He saw all the bitterness. He saw all the brokenness. He saw all the loneliness. He saw all the lack of love. He saw it all. He saw all the looks of embarrassment, all the looks of pity, all the tears in the shower, all the school dances when she stood in the corner all alone, all the times she was looked over and didn't make the team, all the times she was in the shower and the mascara was running down her face due to the pain of rejection. The Lord saw it all. And not only did he see it all, he sought to heal it all. Verse 32. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery, surely my husband will love me now. Can I stop right here? Listen to me, ladies. Sleeping with a man and giving him what he wants will not make him love you. He will take what he wants and he will leave you brokenhearted. He, he will test drive the car and when he gets tired of that car, he will go looking for another one. Let's read on. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I have not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again, she conceived, and 
when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So she named him Levi. Let me stop right here and say, ladies, having a kid with him will not make him stay either. But God saw her. And God blessed her with children. But Leah couldn't see it. Her obsession with what she did not have overruled her enjoyment and acknowledgement of what she did have. Look at how she named her three children. Reuben means misery. Simeon means not loved. And Levi means attached. And discouragement happens when there is a gap between what we expect and what we experience. And all of us, at some time or another, will find ourselves in that gap between our expectations and our experience. And when those two things combine, discouragement will show up in a variety of ways. Sometimes it will come in like a mighty flood of darkness. But other times it's just this constant drip that's just there every single day. And as it was for Leah, it is also true for us. It most often shows up when we get married and when we have kids. Now, I got to be honest with y'all. Um, I did not think much about having kids when I was growing up. You, you seem surprised. Uh, that means that I did not have my, G.O. Joe, my G.I. Joes and be like, these are going to be all your little boys, Daniel. And one day you're going to have an army full of little boys and you're going to fight. I never did that. Okay, y'all are looking at me with judgment right now. Y'all may have done that. I'm just telling you for me, I did not think about having a brood of boys when I was growing up. So what I'm saying is I did not have a lot of expectations when it came to parenting. But the little expectations that I did have were a whole lot different than the experience I got. Our son Noah was with us in the last celebration. So good to have Noah home with us before he's starting school. And I, I pay Miss Amy to sit in in these four celebrations so that she will always verify that the things I'm saying up here are absolutely true. Because I think sometimes y'all assume that I make this stuff up. I don't make this stuff up. I might spiritualize them a little bit and I might pasteurize them a little bit. But you can testify that these things I say are true. Right, Miss Amy? All right. Don't look at me with judgment. I already feel judged by these people. I need your support, mama. Okay. Did Noah not cry for the first six months of his life? All day, every day. And we tried everything. Uh, he never would take a bottle uh, very well. He, he did not do a pacifier at all. Um, we tried, was it the burrito? They used to wrap the little kids in what they call it, the burrito. That did not work for him. He would scream because he didn't like his arms being cut. He wanted them out. Uh, we would try a car rides in the middle of the night because that was supposed to, to, to soothe them. We tried the, the swoosh, the swooshing sounds or the water sounds like the, 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 the sound machines at night. That didn't help anything. Uh, we tried the washing machine. No, I didn't put him in the washing machine. I put him on top of the washing machine machine and when those little those little I don't even what those things that were called and uh, oh I gotta tell you some stories about the washing machine in my house Dr. Vern we were so poor when I mean that we are poor we couldn't even afford the OR on the end of it that's how poor Miss Amy and I were and uh, my, my washing machine was given to me and it did not have an off switch it had vice grips I had rigged up some vice grips uh, to the little switch so as long as it was in the cycle you couldn't touch the vice grips because then it would shock you if we wanted to have some fun on some Friday night we would see who could hold on to the vice grips the longest without that's why I don't have any hair I burnt off every single hair because I'm stubborn. No lie. And then, and then we figure out who can get the clothes out of there before the spin cycle. So we put our hand up and be like, whoa, 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 whoa. It was fun, y'all. It was fun, y'all. So we didn't put Noah in the washing machine, but we put him on the washing machine and it, it, nothing, nothing helped. Miss Amy, did I not hold him up in the middle of the night? Like somebody like, oh, -la 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 -la. I, I was bad just now speaking in tongues. Like I never had to do something with this kid. I'm pretty sure that most nights I crowd, cried louder than he was crying. Like, God, you wouldn't have to... To help me. And if the crying wasn't bad enough, every time he got angry, he would hold his breath, he would turn blue, his lips would get purple, he would shake violently, and then he would pass out. Every single time. You remember when he did that and we took him into the ER, and he did it while we were in the ER, and the doctor laughed. Come on, mama, say amen to that and said, this is just his personality. <laughs> Time out. Jay, 
Baby Wise, Lamaze class, ain't nothing taught me that I was gonna have a kid with a passing out personality. I didn't read that in any book. I didn't expect much, but I did not see that experience coming. And he did it until he was four. It was after his fourth exorcism that he finally stopped. <laughs> I'm teasing. Kind of, kind of, kind of. We would trade drastic measures, y'all. Uh, but he eventually grew, outgrew it. Um, expectations are a funny thing, right? Because you don't even know they're there until they go unmet. And once they go unmet, watch out because all hell breaks loose. When Amy and I got married... Uh, she thought that I would be Prince Charming. She found out that I was just a horny toad. I'm just saying. <laughs> Scratch that. <laughs> I've been waiting on that one all morning long, baby. I've been holding that in my back pocket. That's why we come to noon, baby. The flesh was willing, but the spirit cried out. But in fairness, she, well... I thought that she would see this as an opportunity. <laughs> she saw more as an obligation. See, that's how the men got real quiet on that one right there. That's how I know I'm preaching the truth. Like, Y'all ain't going to support me for nothing. <laughs> what we expected and what we experienced were miles apart. And when that happens, disappointment takes root and discouragement takes over. And it sounds a little like this. If God loved me, this wouldn't have happened to me. Uh, I hope that our marriage would be better now. I've been praying about it, but God's not changing him. I, I thought that I would get that promotion by now because I'm working really, really hard, and, God, and I haven't gotten it. Somebody else has received it. Where is God? I raised my kids the right way, but they're going the wrong way. Does God even care about me? For goodness sakes, I stayed pure, but my right person hasn't came walking in my life just yet. God, if you're so good, why is all this bad stuff happening to me? But the truth of the scriptures is we can't let what we expect keep us from what God wants us to experience. You see, we can't let discouragement fill our minds with doubt about the goodness of God because the scripture goes on. She conceived again, and she, when she gave birth to a son, she said, this time, everyone say this time. This time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah, which means praise. Then she stopped having children. Notice the phrase, this time. You see, for many years, she was hoping another person or another child or another reward or another elevation or another event would meet her needs, but it never did. And if you're constantly waiting for someone else to encourage you, waiting for someone else to lift your spirits, waiting for someone else to meet all of your needs, waiting for somebody else to say you're good enough or you're valuable enough or you're smart enough or you're pretty enough, it may never come. So finally, she stopped waiting for the perfect person, stopped waiting for the perfect time, and she realized she was the only one who had the power to choose her own happiness. So she said, this time I will praise the Lord, not next time, not once upon a time, but this time I will praise the Lord. But the problem is, most of us can't get past the last time. And most of us are waiting for the perfect time. So we live in this constant state of discouragement because we have not figured out how to be happy at this time. But please listen, you can't change last time. And you don't even know if there will be a next time. So you've got to learn to be joyful at this time. Because too many of us are waiting for the perfect time. Or we can't get past that last time. The perfect person, perfect event. When I get that job, when I get that house, when I get that promotion, when my health gets right, when my kids move out and my kids graduate, my, my kids get married, and when I get a, out, of, out of debt, then I'll be happy. No, you won't. It'll be something else. So she says, this time I will praise the Lord. How many of you um, grew up in church and it's somewhere in the first you know, 15 minutes of the worship service, in their case, 
uh, would have a moment where it just got really, really awkward. They're like, hey, if you're visiting with us today, we want you to stand up and we want you to tell us your name and tell us where you're from so we can all like, get to know you a little bit. And the problem was there were like 200 Baptists in the room and there were like two visitors in the room. So you'd like have 100 people swarming these people. Y'all remember those awkward days? We don't do that here, right? We don't do that here. Um, and, and while we were doing it, it was even more awkward because we would sing to them, basically, right? You had to have a song that you were singing when you were shaking hands and, 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 and hugging necks. So you had to choose, the song leader had to choose a song that everybody would know because, you know, we weren't going to be looking at the screens because we're all fixated on the one visitor we have with us today. Uh, so at my church, we used to sing this song. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad. How many of y'all know this song? How many of y'all know this song? Let's have a little Sunday. Let's make it real awkward for the visitors in here today. This is the day, this is. I feel like I got the Methodist section over here today. I need something more from y'all. I used to lead choir. I'm good at this. Oh, no, cut that out, cut that out, cut that out. But what most of us don't realize is that it's actually a verse in Scripture. It's Psalms 118, 24 that says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I want you to notice it says, this is the day. Not yesterday, not tomorrow. This is the day the Lord has made. Therefore, I'll rejoice and be glad in it today because I don't know if there will even be a tomorrow. Why wait till my marriage gets right, or my kids get right, or my boss gets right, or my health gets right? That may never happen. So I have to choose to rejoice and be glad today. Yeah. But there's a voice in our head that says in order for you to be happy, you need a new spouse. You need a new job. You need a better house, a bigger house, or better health. No, 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 no. True joy, the joy that comes from the Father, the joy that can never be taken away, is not determined by what happens to me, but how I see what happens to me. Amen. And you may not see what God is doing today, but you will someday because God was not building a family. God was building a nation. Jacob's name was eventually changed to Israel. Leah would end up having six boys. That means that half of the 12 tribes of Israel came from Leah's loins. Le Levi, her son, would become the father of all the priests. Judah, her son, would end up becoming the lion, or from his lineage, the lion of the tribe of Judah. What are you talking about, Pastor? That means that from Leah's loins would come the Messiah, God's son, Jesus Christ. It's Pastor Craig Rochelle who always says this. If God met your expectations, he would never be able to exceed them. You see, God has plans for you right now that you know nothing about. That's why Ephesians 3.20 says, Now all glory goes to God who is able through his mighty power that is at work within you to accomplish more than we might even ask, think, dream, or imagine. You see, your brain can't comprehend what God wants to do in your life. Your expectations are way lower than the experience that God wants for you. You don't have to see it to believe it, but if you believe it, you will see it. So Leah says, this time I will praise the Lord. And nothing brings us into God's presence more quickly than praising God at this time. And nothing will take us out of his presence more quickly than looking to next time. And praising God is not based on how good my situation seems. Praising God is based upon how good God is or how good my life really is. So we can spend our time complaining about having kids who run around our house yelling and screaming or we can thank him for the healthy kids that we prayed for. We can complain that our husband leaves his dirty drawers on the floor or we can thank God that we got a man who works hard. We can complain about our job or we can thank God, that we have a job that puts food on a table and shoes on our kids' feet. Because someone would love to have a kid in their house, but they don't. Someone would love to have a spouse, but they don't. Someone would love to have your job, but they don't. Someone would love your looks, but they don't. Someone would love your intelligence, but they don't. Somebody would love your hair, but they don't got it. That's a little personal. I should have left that out. I should have left that out. Left that out. 
because tall girls wish they were more small and athletically built. People with curly hair wish they had straight hair. People with brown hair wish they had blonde hair. The hardest place for you to be is where you're at and to be grateful for what you have. You see, you have these things. So why not praise him in this time? Because praise begins where entitlement ends and discouragement ends when praise begins. Here's what the psalmist says. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget all, all of his benefits. Listen to this. Listen to this. This is so good. Who forgives all my sins? Can anybody here today testify that God has forgiven their sins? Can anybody testify that he's healed your body? He's redeemed your life from the pit, and he's crowned you with love and compassion who has satisfied your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. It was Henry Cloud who says that those who have the greatest discouragement have the greatest need for gratitude. That praise takes our minds someplace else. Praise doesn't clear the tracks of discouragement. It just gives us the power to keep going when all the other voices say quit. All of us can identify with Leah. Always being compared to someone else. Or maybe feeling unloved invisible or insignificant. Tragically, maybe longing for a husband's affection or each child to being born, you're like, finally, this person will love me only to be disappointed time and time again. But when Judah was finally born, she came to realize, nope, the Lord sees me. The Lord loves me. The Lord has blessed me and the Lord has favored me. But that's not all. Jacob finally does too. You see, it was on Jacob's deathbed. You can read about this in Genesis chapter 49, verse 31. That Jacob asked to be buried next to Leah. You see, Rachel was buried in an unmarked tomb alone. But because God saw Leah, and it took time for her to see that too, she finally realized that he had been working the entire time. And because God had been working the entire time, Jacob got to the place where he loved her too. You and I will remember her for all time. And we worship from her lineage, Jesus Christ, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who came from Leah. God sees you. And God will reward you in due time. So hang in there and learn to praise God at this time. Hey, don't turn off just yet. I got one more thing to say to you. What is that? Thank you once again for taking the time to watch today's message. If this message has been a blessing to you, share it with as many people as you can and make sure you like and you subscribe to this channel and consider investing back into Mountain View. We have a general fund, we have a legacy expansion fund, and we hope to continue to reach as many people as we can for multiple generations through your generosity. Thank you so much and look forward to hearing about how God is going to bless you through this ministry.